there's actually um, this comes out of this discussion. I think it's it's relevant, and there are a couple of questions here which will bring us back around. And I know there's a question in the audience, and we'll get to it in a moment. Um, why does it take more than 10 years for someone with chronic pain to have a diagnosis, and why might they not have the diagnosis yet? How many years should it take until someone who has daily pain gets a diagnosis, and how can you get the best diagnosis without um, so many puzzle pieces, as Sandra would have put it? And I don't know where you want to start with that. <laughs> How many um, years should it take before you get a diagnosis? It, it, it depends. Uh, okay. Pain is two things. I tell my patients, pain can be a symptom of a disease, and we have to treat the disease, or pain can be the disease itself, and then we have to treat the pain. So just an example. So when pain is a symptom of a disease, uh, it could be an appendicitis, it doesn't, you don't treat appendicitis with opioids. You don't treat appendicitis with anti-inflammatories. You go and you remove the appendix. Um, so that's easy because you can identify the source of pain and you can treat the pain and once you remove the pain, the pain is gone. When we have a musculoskeletal injury or a neuropathic injury that it's, it's hard to remove the cause, it's hard to go and remove the joint, Sometimes it's in the spine, it's a small ligament or muscle or a facet joint. Um, you can do some procedures to identify, but sometimes it's multi-levels and you do some things it doesn't resolve. So it's a fine line to differentiate between when pain is a symptom of something or when the pain becomes a disease itself. So pain that becomes a disease itself is when a person suffers from pain uh, from, uh, um, it could be days, months, or years, and then the central nerve system is modified uh, because of that impulses every day, every hour. The brain changes, the spinal cord changes, the nerve changes, there is a lot of receptors that didn't exist before, now they exist. So that's when the pain becomes a disease itself. Even removing the cause of the disease doesn't go away. We see this in osteoarthritis. We see people who had uh, uh, knee pain for many years because they had osteoarthritis. But that pain in the knee was modifying the brain a little by little every day. So now the, the brain and the central nervous system is more sensitized to pain. You go and you remove the cause of pain. You put a new knee and the pain doesn't go away. The person now has chronic pain. So what happens is we have to treat the chronic pain as chronic pain. It's a disease now. It's hard to make the distinction when it's decide and when it's decide. So that's probably why it takes so long. Sometimes the physicians are trying to treat this, the disease that is causing the pain. It's trying, trying, trying. Nothing's happening. Uh, and then the pain is becoming chronic until someone says, stop. We tried everything to treat the cause of your pain. Now you have chronic pain disease. It's a disease. Um, but it's hard even for the physician to say, to tell that diagnosis because it's a, like a death sentence. Oh, so then this means that the, brain is, the pain is in my brain and I'm crazy. You're telling me that I'm crazy, that I'll not, never get better. No, I'm not saying this. I'm just saying that the pain that you were feeling all these years sensitized your brain. You lost the ability to fight the pain. We call this descending inhibitory pathways. We have our own analgesic mechanisms, and some people lose this because that's one of the changes that happen in the brain. So they lose the ability to do their own inhibition of pain, and they now they have a disease in the brain. Yeah, the disease is in the brain, in the brain, but it doesn't mean that you're crazy, that you're inventing this. It's real, it's there. But the pain became chronic. So for all this process to happen until someone tells you that's what you have, chronic pain syndrome, chronic pain disease, it takes time. It, it, it's, uh, it's really problematic. I mean, I, I find the approach that I use with patients is to say, let's, we look to, to be sure that we have anything which might be, have a specific treatment, we've identified and treated appropriately. And once we've done that, then we may be left with a pain problem which doesn't have a specific treatment, and that's where we move into using 
pain treatments which are not disease modifying. So if you have pain from ischemic heart, if you got chest pain because you got heart disease, then and every time you walk upstairs you get chest pain, then we'll go in, we'll reverse the, you know, do a stent or do a coronary, coronary artery bypass or give you beta blockers or some sort of angina treatment and fix the disease itself. And that's relatively straightforward. Um, if you continue to have chest pain after we've fixed the disease and your heart is now receiving the appropriate amount of oxygenated blood, then you have pain that persists. Then it involves, as Andrea says, a whole other education process and maybe different medications. Um, Ten years seems a little long to me, um, even, yeah. So I, I, the difficulty there is bringing the whole picture together. And, and that we've thought of always as the traditional job of the family physician to, to consolidate all of the information from all your specialists. Um, a third of the patients in my chronic pain clinic do not have family physicians for one reason or another. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a problem. Those, typically those patients have come to me by referrals from other specialists or when they've been admitted to hospital with other problems and we've picked them up. So they do not have a family physician to consolidate that information and try and round it up for them. Uh, and some family physicians don't like doing that or they're not very good at it because they haven't been trained in understanding the assessment of pain itself. So it, it, it is uh, there's definitely a significant issue uh, in Canada and actually in medicine in general around the world with the assessment of pain and the consolidation of all that information. It's what keeps the Canadian and international pain societies going. The one issue is that pain is not recognized as a disease in Canada. Diabetes is, heart disease is, chronic pain in itself is not recognized as a disease. So if it's not recognized as a disease, then it doesn't exist, right? <laughs> um, in April of 2012, the Canadian Pain Coalition and the Canadian Pain Society have come together to put a document called the National Pain Strategy, and they are going to uh, release it. Um, in April and it's to bring attention to the fact that 6.8 million Canadians live with pain every day and as Dr. Furlan says that's more than than uh, cancer, heart disease and arthritis, diabetes, diabetes and arthritis combined. Um, it's something that needs to happen. We need to have our, our illness recognized. I don't like to call it an illness but that's what it is. But only by saying that it is an illness and having it recognized will we get better treatment for it? If you look at the diabetes management programs now, um, every three months a diabetic is to be seen by their physician. They're lucky, they have a blood test that they can tell them how their diabetes has been controlled. And there's other measures that each family physician is to do every three months in the person with diabetes. We need some guidelines that, like this so that our family physicians are informed and can help us to help ourselves live better with pain. I'll take the question from the audience, the wandering microphone there. 